20th century against the Herero and the Nama peoples. A country that has known only too well the pain and suffering of occupation, colonialism, systematic discrimination, apartheid, and their entrenched consequences. It is because of this history that Namibia considers it a moral duty and sacred responsibility to appear before this court on the question of the indefensible occupation of Palestine by Israel. The parallels between Namibia and Palestine are striking and painful. Both were integral parts of the mandate system established after World War I, and in both cases, the so-called sacred trust of civilization, which aimed to guide these nations towards self-determination and independence, was utterly betrayed. Instead of achieving self-government, both Namibians and Palestinians suffered the loss of human dignity, life, liberty, and the outright theft of their land and natural resources. Hundreds of thousands of their people were violently expelled from their homes or forced into exile, joining the ranks of the world's refugees. Upon the dissolution of the League of Nations in 1946, the white minority South African regime refused to place Namibia, then Southwest Africa, under the UN trusteeship and sought to illegally annex our territory as a fifth province, implementing racist homeland policies and apartheid laws targeting black Africans. Today, Palestinians have had to endure the seizure of their land and property, illegal settlements, unlawful killings, forced displacement, drastic movement restrictions, the denial of refugees' right to return, and of equal nationality and citizenship. The lived reality of the people of Palestine evokes painful memories for many Namibians of my generation. Namibians still experience the entrenched and structural impact of inequality as a direct consequence of colonialism and the prolonged unlawful occupation. Mr. President, members of the court, this court's four advisory opinions on Southwest Africa played a vital role in our liberation struggle. In its 1971 opinion, the court confirmed the right of self-determination as a legal imperative with decisive consequences for states, paving the way for our independence 19 years later in 1990. It is because of Namibia's experience with apartheid and its long fight for self-determination that we cannot look the other way in the face of the brutal atrocities committed against the Palestinian people. Mr. President, members of the court, we ask you not to look away either. Rather, we appeal to you once again end the historic and ongoing injustice by upholding the fundamental rights of a dispossessed people who have endured 57 years of a suffocating occupation. Today, Palestinians are enduring collective punishment in the besieged Gaza Strip, with civilians being killed in continuous and indiscriminate bombardments at a scale that is unprecedented in recent history. This state of affairs, this hell on earth, represents a stain on the collective conscience of the world. Civilized nations cannot and must not accept images of children covered in blood with gaping wounds 
of men and women crying in despair because of the helplessness they feel. However, in the midst of the ongoing tragedy, I wish to say the following to the people of Palestine. This advisory opinion is an important moment in your long fight for independence. And I leave you with the words of our founding president and father of the Namibian nation, Dr. Sam Nyoma. A people united, striving to achieve a common good for all members of society will always emerge victorious. End of quote. Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you and I now respectfully ask that Professor Phoebe Okoa be called to address the legal questions before the court. I thank Mrs. Dosab. I now give the floor to Professor Phoebe Okawa. You have the floor, Professor. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the court, it's a great honor for me to appear before you in these proceedings and a special privilege to do so on behalf of the Republic of Namibia. Our presentation is in three parts. First, I will make two general observations on why the court should answer the request in its entirety and why Israel's occupation is illegal. Then I will focus on Israel's policies and practices in the occupied Palestinian territory that grossly violate its obligations under international law, specifically the prohibition of apartheid and racial discrimination and the principle of self-determination. Finally, I will address the legal consequences that arise for Israel, for third states and for the United Nations on account of these violations. As a threshold matter, Namibia reiterates, as do the overwhelming majority of states in these proceedings, that the court has jurisdiction to render the requested advisory opinion and that there are no compelling reasons for the court to decline the request. Namibia notes that there is also wide consensus among the participants on the legal status of the occupation. Namibia makes only four brief observations. First, insofar as the law of occupation envisages any belligerent occupation as a temporary measure immediately following military operations, Israel's prolonged or permanent occupation breaches the law of occupation. It is a de facto annexation in all but name. Second, Israel's occupation in and of itself is unlawful under general international law. This is because it violates the Charter of the United Nations and peremptory norms, specifically the prohibition on territorial acquisitions through illegal use of force, the principle of self-determination, and the prohibition of apartheid. Third, Successive resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly have declared Israel's occupation to be illegal and called on Israel to end it immediately. These resolutions provide an independent source of authority for the illegality of the occupation. Finally, the continuation of the illegal occupation does not absolve Israel from its obligations and responsibilities under international law. This is consistent with your own conclusions in the Namibia advisory opinion that physical control over territory and not sovereignty or legitimacy of title is the basis of state liability for acts affecting other states. In both its written and oral submissions, Namibia focuses on the prohibition of apartheid 
and of racial discrimination. This is in part on account of Namibia's history as one of the few countries that was subjected to this egregious form of systematic and institutionalized racial discrimination. We also do so on account of the fundamental importance of the court's 1971 Namibia opinion where this court declared that the policies of apartheid constitute a denial of fundamental human rights under a flagrant violation of the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. But above all, we do this because notwithstanding the egregious nature of apartheid as a state delict, as a violation of a peremptory norm, and as a crime, it has received virtually no clarification beyond the specific circumstances of Southern Africa. An advisory opinion on threshold questions of apartheid will therefore assist the General Assembly in respect of its own action in identifying the key elements of, it, of the illegality and in formulating appropriate responses to Israel's discriminatory practices in the occupied Palestinian territory. Specifically, we invite the court to clarify three aspects of the obligation. First, we respectfully ask the court to make it clear that the prohibition of apartheid is not limited to Southern Africa in the last century. It extends to Israel's policies in the occupied Palestinian territory today. Article 3 of SAD places all state parties, including Israel, under an obligation to prevent, prohibit, and eradicate apartheid in territories under their jurisdiction. This is also the conclusion of the SAD Committee. The 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, negotiated after the end of apartheid in South Africa, also recognized apartheid as a crime against humanity without temporal or geographical restriction. Second, the court should also confirm that the prohibition of apartheid binds all states as a peremptory norm. In your decision, in the case under SAD brought by Qatar against United Arab Emirates, you acknowledged the universal character of SAD is confirmed by the fact that while 82 states are parties to it. The International Law Commission and its Special Rapporteur on Use Cogents, as Judge Ladi then was, has also expressly recognized the peremptory character of the prohibition of apartheid. Finally, Namibia invites the court to clarify the definition of apartheid. Namibia aligns itself with other participants that the definition in Article 2 of the Apartheid Convention incorporates the three key elements of the delict under international law. First, the state must engage in one or more inhumane acts. Crucially, these take the form of violations of fundamental human rights within an institutionalized framework of systematic oppression and domination. Second, these inhumane acts must be directed against a racial group or its members. Finally, the state must commit this inhumane act for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group over the other and systematically oppressing them. Other participants have already made extensive statements on the discriminatory and inhumane acts carried out against the Palestinians as a racial group. These policies and practices are too many to enumerate in the time available. They include laws that discriminate in matters of citizenship, ownership and transfer of property, 
and freedom of movement. The systematic and excessive use of force against Palestinian civilians, the arbitrary killings and mass incarceration of Palestinians, including children, the illegal settlements, the discriminatory residency regulations, and crucially, the denial of a Palestinian identity by refusing to recognize them as a people with a right to determine their own political destiny and to pursue social, economic, and cultural development. Namibia's submission will focus on the final requirement, the purpose of establishing, maintaining domination and systematic oppression. First, the term domination signifies a pervasive, all-encompassing, serious form of control over a group. Second, oppression implies prolonged cruelty reflecting a sustained violation of human rights. Third, systematic implies the organized nature of violent acts and the improbability of their random occurrence. Namibia shares the view of other participants that Israel's policies and practices meet the evidentiary standard for establishing the state delict of apartheid. The Israeli government's openly articulated aim is to ensure Jewish-Israeli control of all facets of Palestinian life as evidenced by legislation affirming Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people with unique self-determination rights reserved for Jewish individuals only. It is clear from all the available evidence that these discriminatory practices are not accidental or fortuitous, but are designed for the specific purpose of privileging Jewish Israelis over Palestinians. The fact that the practices in question may have other collateral objectives, such as maintaining security, is irrelevant. It will suffice if the primary motive is discriminatory, even if it also serves ancillary purposes. It follows in Namibia's submission that Israel's policies and practices are inconsistent with the prohibition of apartheid as a state delict under international law. Furthermore, these discriminatory practices in the context of prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territories violates the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. As other participants have highlighted, these discriminatory policies and practices are directed at fragmenting the Palestinian people. These elaborate systems of administrative controls undermine group cohesiveness by dividing the Palestinian people into a number of administrative domains or groups with varying degrees of rights. This strategic fragmentation of the occupied Palestinian territory into Bantu stands makes Palestinian life burdensome and in many cases unbearable, forcing them to leave their homes. Perhaps the epitome of discriminatory laws negating the Palestinian right of self-determination is the 2018 Basic Law passed with constitutional status which boldly declares that Israel is the nation of the Jewish people and that Jewish settlement is a national value. I will now turn to the final part of my submission. I will first examine the legal consequences of Israel's violations irrespective of the status of the occupation. Second, I will examine the legal consequences arising out of the illegal status of the occupation. First, Israel must bear consequences for its violations. This is the most elementary requirement of the law on state responsibility. As others in these proceedings have highlighted, 
This includes the obligations of secession and the duty to make reparation for more than five decades of harms inflicted on the Palestinian people. The government of Israel has a legal duty to dismantle all the vestiges of systematic racial discrimination and oppression that permeates all aspects of Palestinian life in the occupied territories. As the state of Palestine itself said on Monday, Israel must bring to an end the annexation of Palestinian land, dismantle existing settlements, and recognize the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination in a viable state of their own. Second, states are under an obligation not to recognize Israel's breaches of peremptory norms of general international law vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people. At the same time, the obligation of non-recognition is marked by a parallel and positive duty of recognition of the Palestinian people's right to self-determination realized through a viable and independent state of Palestine. Here, we ask the court to pay particular attention to the historical context of these proceedings. Admission to the United Nations, unlike the League of Nations, was not automatic. It was conditioned on the state accepting to uphold the values and principles contained in the Charter, including self-determination. The admission of Israel was no exception. In the world opinion, you observe that when Israel proclaimed its independence, it did so on the strength of the partition plan resolution of the General Assembly. As is well known, that plan envisaged two states, one Arab and one Jewish. The Israeli Declaration of Independence makes this plain by recognizing, and here I quote, the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations, in their own sovereign states, unquote. If that logic applied to the self-determination and statehood of the Jewish people, it must, by the same token, also apply to the self-determination and statehood of the Palestinian people. We further ask the court to consider whether there may be circumstances where political discretion in matters of recognition gives way to a positive duty of recognition, especially when it is necessary to safeguard a peremptory norm. And here, Namibia aligns itself with Jordan's recent submission that all states are also under an obligation to recognize the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, including by exercising that right within a viable and independent state of Palestine. Since Israel's policies and practices violate peremptory norms of international law, the occupation itself is unlawful. This entails consequences for Israel, for third states, and for the United Nations. In the Namibia opinion, you already set out the legal consequences of unlawful occupation. There, you said that once the court is faced with an illegal situation, it would be failing in the discharge of its judicial functions if it did not declare that there is an obligation, especially upon members of the United Nations, to bring the situation to an end. In that opinion, you recognize the clear obligation on South Africa to put an end to the illegal occupation and withdraw its administration from the territory. The same consequences must of necessity attach to the illegal occupation by Israel of the Palestinian territories. Secession cannot be contingent on external factors such as the successful outcome of our negotiations as pointed out by some participants in these proceedings. A withdrawal contingent on the outcome of political negotiations effectively gives Israel a veto over the future of the Palestinian people. 
Namibia invites the court to set a strict time limit within which Israel must be asked by the General Assembly to bring the occupation to an end without conditions. Failure to set a strict time limit has the perverse effect of being treated as a question in the present occupation and permission for it to continue indefinitely. Of course, Israel has defied this court and ultimatums issued by the United Nations organs many times. But it is precisely for this kind of egregious violations of peremptory norms that a regime of countermeasures was contemplated in the now widely accepted International Law Commission draft articles on state responsibility. Equality before the law is a cardinal principle of the United Nations Charter. No state, not Israel, should be exempt from the comprehensive regime of sanctions. Moreover, Namibia reaffirms the position held by the majority of participants that all states are under an obligation not to recognize, assist, support, or contribute to the continuation of the unlawful occupation. This is also in line with your own settled jurisprudence. In the wall opinion, you confirmed that obligations of third states include the obligation not to render aid or assistance in maintaining the illegal situation. That all states must refrain from all forms of assistance, including transfer of arms and political support that de facto perpetuates the occupation. In Namibia's view, this means, in particular, that all states are under an obligation to ensure that companies under their jurisdiction or control do not trade in Israeli goods or with Israeli companies originating from or linked to Israel's illegal occupation. Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you for your kind attention. This concludes Namibia's oral submissions. Thank you. I thank the delegation of Namibia for its presentation. I invite the next participating delegation, Norway, to address the court and call Mr. Christian Gerber to the podium. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, I have the honor to appear before you on behalf of the government of Norway in the present proceedings. Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory has continued since 1967. Recent developments give rise to the utmost concern. They include ongoing indiscriminate and disproportionate use of force and other measures in the Gaza Strip, as well as illegal settlements in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. House evictions, demolitions, Forced displacement and settler violence against the Palestinian population are aspects of the Israeli occupation. Such acts run counter to fundamental human rights, international humanitarian law, and the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people. They threaten the foundations under international law for the vision of a region where two states, Israel and Palestine, live side by side within secure and recognized borders. Against this background, an advice to your opinion will provide essential and timely guidance to the international community. The atrocities committed by Hamas and directed from the Gaza Strip on 7th October 2023 constituted heinous and massive terrorist attacks. Repeated rocket attacks launched from Hamas and other groups in Gaza against Israel constitute violations of international humanitarian law due to their obvious indiscriminate nature. Individuals responsible for atrocities and other crimes must be held accountable. Those constituting real and imminent threats to the Israeli population and territory expose themselves as lawful military targets within the constraints of international law. This does, however, 
not justify any breaches of international humanitarian law, including by inciting or taking measures directed against the civilian population. Norway takes due note of the provisional measures indicated by this court on 26th of January this year. Mr. President, the Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem constitute a chief obstacle to any prospect of settlement and peace in the area. In its advisory opinion of 2004 on the legality of the construction of a wall, this court stated that the Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, have been established in breach of international law. The Security Council has in numerous resolutions, including 2334 of 2016, restated its determination that the settlements constitute a flagrant violation of international law and stressed the need to reverse the negative trends on the ground which are steadily eroding the two-state solution and entrenching a one-state reality. Against this background, I will first address administration and annexation of territory under occupation. I will then ask whether Israel's continued occupation may still be seen as temporary administration of territory in accordance with international law on military occupation, or whether the occupied Palestinian territory is gradually being subject to illegal annexation. Drawing on the court's advisory opinion in Namibia, I will pose the question whether Israel must end its occupation of the territory. Ambassador FIFA will thereafter address specific elements which are part of the legal framework applicable under international law to the occupied Palestinian territory. At the outset, we recall that the definition of occupied territory in Article 42 of the 1907 Hague Regulations relies on a factual assessment. A territory is considered occupied when it is actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. This triggered key regal, uh, rules, in particular out of humanitarian considerations and notably pursuant to the Fourth Geneva Convention. The factual assessment made by this court at the time of the wall opinion remains, in our view, entirely true today. Both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are integral parts of the territory occupied by Israel in 1967, irrespective of the uh, Israel military withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. The Security Council recently stressed in its resolution 2720 of 2023 that the Gaza Strip constitutes an integral part of the territory occupied in 1967 and reiterated the vision of the two-state solution with the Gaza Strip as part of the Palestinian state, echoing its resolution 1860 of 2009. The protection given to the civilian population by the laws of occupation continue to apply. This does, however, not impede a consideration of the legality of the occupation as such. The occupation has now lasted for more than half a century. While international law does not set any specific time limit, military occupation is, in essence, temporary. This is evident from provisions such as Articles 6, 3 and 47 of the Fourth Geneva Convention and was recalled by the General Assembly in its Resolution 77-126 in 2022 emphasizing that the occupation of a territory is to be a temporary de facto situation, whereby the occupying power can neither claim possession nor exert its sovereignty over the territory it occupies. Recognized authorities have reminded us that the law on belligerent occupation is based on the assumption that occupation of foreign territory being an extraordinary measure may be justified for a limited time only. A military occupation cannot be permanent. If an occupation is allowed to be indefinite, then the distinction and the use of bellum between occupation and annexation dissolves. Furthermore, risks are patent with regard to deportations, transfers and evacua evacuations 
in breach of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Both this Court and the Security Council have found Israel to have violated this provision. Such developments give reason to ask whether the situation is turning into a de facto annexation. I now turn to the possible legal consequences arising from such prolonged occupation with regard to the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. In its advisory opinion on the wall, the court noted that the principle of self-determination of peoples has been enshrined in the United Nations Charter and reaffirmed by the General Assembly in Resolution 2625, pursuant to which every state has the duty to refrain from any forcible action which deprives peoples referred to of their right to self-determination. The court notes in para 149 that Israel is bound to comply with its obligation to respect the rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination. It added that there was a risk of further alterations to the demographic composition of the territory, contributing to the departure of Palestinian population from certain areas. On this basis, the court concluded that the construction of the wall, along with the measures taken previously, severely impeded the exercise by the Palestinian people to its right to self-determination and is therefore a breach of Israel's obligations to respect that right. In its 2019 advisory opinion on Chagos, para 160, the court emphasized the customary law character of the right to territorial integrity of a non-self-governing territory as the corollary of the right to self-determination. It follows that any detachment by the administering power of part of a non-self-governing territory, unless based on the freely expressed and genuine will of the people of that territory, is contrary to the right to self-determination. Norway believes that permanent or irreversible measures taken by Israel on occupied Palestinian territory would likewise be contrary to the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. I turn now to annexation. Annexation is a unilateral act by which a state incorporates into its territory all or part of the territory of another. As a concomitant of the prohibition on the threat or use of force in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, annexation is prohibited under customary international law. This prohibition is reflected in Security Council Resolution 242 of 1967, referring to the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war, repeated in its Resolution 298 of 1971. It is on this basis that the Security Council, in its Resolution 469 of 1980, declared Israel's de jure annexation of East Jerusalem to be invalid. What form annexation takes is relevant. To quote the court, with regard to the question of form, it should be observed that this is not a domain in which international law imposes any special or strict requirements. This is why it must be reiterated that annexation under any form, whether de jure or de facto, is illegal under international law. The formal characterization is immaterial. Nevertheless, there are grounds for asking whether Israel's occupation may be seen as tantamount to de facto annexation, as the court did in the Wall opinion. And I quote, the construction of the wall and its associated regime create a fait accompli on the ground that could well become permanent, in which case, and notwithstanding the formal characterization of the wall by Israel, it would be tantamount to de facto annexation. End of quote. In its September 2022 report, the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory, including East Jerusalem, held that, quote, Israel treats the occupation as permanent and has, for all intents and purposes, annexed parts of the West Bank while seeking to hide behind a fiction of temporariness. Actions by Israel constituting de facto annexation include expropriating land and natural resources, establishing settlements and outposts, 
maintaining a restrictive and discriminatory planning and building regime for Palestinians and extending Israeli law extraterritorially to Israeli settlers in the West Bank. The Commission considered the situation tantamount to a de facto annexation as alluded to by the Court. The Court may wish to consider the following aspects when determining whether Israel's occupation may be tantamount to de facto annexation. First, the establishment of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory represents a transfer over decades of parts of the occupying power's own civilian population into the territory it occupies in breach of Article 49.6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. The Security Council has repeatedly, including in Resolution 2334 of 2016, condemned all measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character and status of the territory occupied since 1967. Second, it could be asked whether the duration of the occupation, which has now lasted for more than half a century, in itself renders the occupation tantamount to de facto annexation. Third, there are grounds for serious concerns regarding announced plans for further expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Fourth, Israel has appropriated natural resources of the West Bank, including water resources, and seized control of a physical infrastructure in order to bind the area closer to itself, and, it seems, to render irreversible its presence in the territory. Of particular concern are the repeated demolitions of the local Palestinian Bedouin communities and plans for infrastructure constructions that will isolate Bethlehem and the southern West Bank from East Jerusalem. Fifth, political leaders in Israel have stated that Israel's aim is a de facto annexation of the territory. In 2019, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared that Israel would continue to build and develop the West Bank. He said that not one resident or community will be uprooted in a political agreement. And Israeli military and security forces will continue to rule the entire territory. He later pledged that his government would be applying Israeli sovereignty over all the communities to which Israeli settlers had been transferred. Norway looks forward to the determination by the court whether the occupation may have become tantamount to de facto annexation. Moreover, statements legitimizing extension of settlements may constitute direct and public incitements to commit further serious violations of international law. The State of Israel must take all measures within its power to prevent and punish such incitements. Norway believes that it would be useful to clearly set out the illegality of any measures tantamount to de facto annexation and underline the clear continued legal obligation of the occupying power as regards protected persons in the territory occupied since 1967. In the case that the court reaches the conclusion that the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories must be seen as tantamount to de facto annexation, the next question is, what would be the legal consequences for Israel? In the 1971 Namibia opinion, this court referred to an obligation on the part of the occupant to withdraw its administration of the territory immediately or as rapidly as possible. Analogous conclusions were drawn by the court in the Chagos opinion. Furthermore, the Security Council in Resolution 476 of 1980 reaffirmed the overriding necessity for ending the prolonged occupation. Mr. President, in the Namibia opinion, the court was mindful of the fundamental consideration that it should not make any determination that would result in adversely affecting the population of the territory in question. This principle is codified in Article 47 of the Fourth Geneva Convention as a cardinal safeguard. 
The provision clearly expresses the general principle that the Fourth Geneva Convention protects civilians regardless of the status of the territory in question. Moreover, the formal characterization of the occupied territory cannot relieve the occupying power of the obligation it owes to the population of that territory. Clear legal obligations incumbent on Israel include access of humanitarian actors to the occupied Palestinian territory, including the Gaza Strip. In Resolution 2720 of 2023, the Security Council reiterated its demand that all parties to the conflict, including Israel, comply with their obligations, including with regard to humanitarian access and the protection of humanitarian personnel and their freedom of movement. I thank you for your attention. I will now ask Ambassador Rolf Einar Fiefe to come to the podium. I thank Mr. Jarvel. I now give the floor to Mr. Fiefe. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, <clears throat> distinguished members of the court, it is an honor for me to appear again before this court on behalf of the Kingdom of Norway. Uh, for completeness, I will now address certain elements which Norway considers to be part of the legal framework applicable to the occupied Palestinian territory. They constitute, in our view, solid foundations under international law for the two-state solution to which Norway is fully committed. Mr. President, I would like to start by noting the statement before this court on the 12th of January by the co-agent of Israel in a contentious case when he recalled, and I quote, the commitments made at the time the state was established as reflected in our Declaration of Independence, end of quote. This reminder of the commitments made in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel on the 14th of May 1948 is indeed important. The Declaration is a key constitutive document for the establishment of the State of Israel. It is based on the strength of Resolution 181 of 1947 of the UN General Assembly concerning the plan of partition with economic union. It is indeed rare to find similar constitutional documents that are explicitly based on a specific United Nations resolution, as was done here. The declaration added that the State of Israel was, and I quote, prepared to cooperate with the agencies and representatives of the United Nations in implementing the resolution, end of quote. Furthermore, the resolution was considered in the declaration to constitute an irrevocable recognition by the United Nations of the right to establish a state. This ought to imply that the same applies to the Palestinian side. An international legal framework has since been built in a figurative sense, brick by brick, under the auspices of the United Nations with a view to achieving a two-state solution. And a point of departure here are the commitments made at the time the State of Israel was established and their subsequent legal relevance. On the 15th of May 1948, the Foreign Minister of the Provisional Government of Israel, Mr. Moshe Sharet, transmitted the contents of the Declaration of Independence to the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Trigvet Lee. On the day independence was declared, Arab neighboring states attacked Israel. On the 16th of November that year, the Security Council demanded in Resolution 62 the establishment of an armistice in all sectors of Palestine. The armistice demarcation lines later established and since referred to as the Green Line were without prejudice to future territorial settlements or boundary lines. On the 29th of November that same year, Foreign Minister Charet sent a formal application for membership in the United Nations to the Secretary General. The letter stated 
that independence had been proclaimed, and I quote, in pursuance of Resolution 181 of the General Assembly. It added that Israel unreservedly accepts the obligations of the United Nations Charter and undertakes to honor them from the day when it becomes a member of the United Nations. End of quote. Mr. President, the subsequent decision-making process concerning UN membership in accordance with Article 4 of the Charter is significant. Pursuant to Article 22 of the Covenant for the League of Nations and the adoption of Class A mandate, Palestine had been provisionally recognized in 1922 as an independent nation subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as it was able to stand alone. By virtue of Article 80 of the Charter, rights of self-determination rights of self-determination were not altered in 1945. They were continued. The announced notice of termination of the Palestine mandate by the United Kingdom in 1947 provided the background for the adoption of Resolution 181, already referred to. Norway voted in favor of that resolution. The two-state solution formed the context of the vote on admission of Israel to UN membership. On the 4th of March 1949, as a member of the Security Council, Norway voted in favour of such admission, stating in its explanation of vote that it was, and I quote, confident that Israel will cooperate fully and loyally with all decisions by organs of the United Nations, end of quote. Subsequently, on the 11th of May that same year, Norway also voted in favour of Resolution 273 on admission in the General Assembly. This decisive resolution, referred to Resolution 181 of 1947, but also to, and I quote, the declarations and explanations made by the representatives of the government of Israel before the ad hoc political committee in respect to the implementation of the said resolutions." End of quote. Indeed, from the 5th to the 9th of May 1949, Israel's representative in that committee, Mr. Abba Eban, had fielded questions from member states. His assurances became an integral part of assessments made by the relevant UN organs as regards membership. For instance, on the 5th of May, Mr. Eban recalled that Resolution 181 recommended that when either state envisaged by that resolution had made its independence effective, end of quote, sympathetic consideration should be given to membership in the UN. He added that, and I quote, the time had come for the UN if it wished Israel to bear the heavy burden of charter obligations to confer upon Israel the protection and status of the charter, end of quote. After the decisive vote in the General Assembly, Foreign Minister Sharet stated that the aftermath of the war had changed some elements in the pattern, pattern envisaged in the 1947 resolution, and that modifications were therefore called for. However, these do not vacate the continued relevance of the framework. The foreign minister noted that Israel's organic connection with the United Nations had combined with its own compelling interest in dictating its course of action in international affairs a cause of undivided loyalty to the Charter of the United Nations and of consecration of the cause of peace, end of quote. Mr. President, such declarations, such explanations were instrumental in securing a majority of votes in the relevant organs of the United Nations. To a Norwegian, 
They may moreover invite the recollection of the so-called Elan Declaration. Assurances given by a foreign minister may, under certain circumstances, give rise to legal consequences as unilateral acts. After exercise of the right of self determination had led to the establishment of the states of Jordan and Israel, the legal framework just described continues to be applicable today. Returning to the current situation, the illegality under international law of certain measures described has already been authoritatively and abundantly made clear. As an example, the unanimously adopted Security Council Resolution 465 of 1980 determined that all measures taken by Israel to change the character, composition, structure, or status of Arab-occupied territories since 1967 have no legal validity. For the sake of good order, it should be noted that nothing in the later peace process, including instruments often collectively referred to as the Oslo Accords, impairs this assessment. These instruments are based on an explicit recognition of the, I quote, legitimate rights of the Palestinian people and their just requirements, end of quote. Neither side shall, according to these instruments, initiate or take any step that will change the status of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip pending the outcome of the permanent status negotiations. It is the view of Norway that a permanent settlement based on Security Council resolutions 242 and 338 must build on a confirmation of the role of international law and of the international legal framework that we have attempted to briefly describe here. Mr. President, our observations do not imply any lack of legitimacy of the establishment or of the rights of the State of Israel. On the contrary, they build on it. However, they also recall the clear obligations of a legal and not merely of a political nature incumbent on Israel. These rights and obligations correlate. They require fully contributing to the realization of the viable State of Palestine. The permanent and irreversible nature of measures described under the prolonged occupation with illegal settlements conduct in relation to the Gaza Strip run counter to the Charter and also to the very commitments made by Israel. It is against this background, Mr. President, members of the Court, that we invite the Court to pronounce itself on the legality of the measures described and of the continued occupation. I've come to the end of my presentation and I thank you for your attention. I thank the delegation of Norway for its presentation. I call upon the next participating delegation, Oman, to address the court and invite His Excellency Mr. Abdullah bin Salim bin Hamad al harithi to take the floor. Mr. President, distinguished honorable members of the court, It is an honor and privilege to appear in front of the court to present a statement on behalf of the government of the Sultanate of Oman in the oral proceedings concerning the advisory opinion on the legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. For more than 75 years, the Palestinians have been living under occupation, oppression, injustice, and daily humiliation committed against them by Israelis. Meanwhile, the international community and the international organizations have failed to assist the people of Palestine 
to realize their aspiration by having their own independent state. Today in Gaza, the world for four months is witnessing one of the worst atrocities and acts of genocide in modern times, where more than 25,000 killed and 69,000 wounded, in addition to 2.2 million living under unbearable conditions, being driven from one place to another in a clear violation of international norms. The advisory opinion request. Oman supports United Nations General, Assembly, General United Nations Resolution 77 by 247 of 30 December 2022, in which the Assembly requested the court to render an advisory opinion in relation to two specific issues, namely, A, the legal consequences arising from Israelis' ongoing violation of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, its prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including the holy city of Jerusalem, and its measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the Palestinian territories and from its adoption for related discri discriminatory legislations and measures. B. Israeli's policies and practices referred in paragraph A affect the legal status of the occupation and the legal consequences that arise for all states and the United Nations from this status. The Sultanate of Oman requests that the following issues are taken in account. One, violation of the right to self-determination that the occupation, settlement, and annexation of Palestinian territory occupied since 1967 by Israel obstructs the realization of the Palestinian people inalienable rights, including their right to self-determination and right to return. There is an overwhelming international agreement on the existence of the right to self-determination and its continued denial in the occupied Palestinian territories. The right to self-determination is enshrined inter alia in Article 1-2 of the Charter of the United Nations. The United Nations General Assembly has consistently reaffirmed the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. The United Nations Security Council has called for an end to the Israeli occupation and the establishment of two states based on the 1967 line. The Human Rights Council consistently recognizes the inalienable permanent and qualified right 
to self-determination of the Palestinian people. Arising from these clear and consistent breaches of the international law in maintaining a 75-year occupation, the court should determine that the government of Israel should bring an immediate and unconditional end to all activities, policies, and laws that prevent and impede Palestinian self-determination, principally by ending the occupation of the Palestinian territory. The court should recognize the clear responsibility on all states to support the establishment of Palestinian self-determination in the line with United Nations resolutions and the United Nations Charter. Two, prolonged occupation, settlement, and annexation of Palestinian territory. The consistent and systematic and lawful transfer of Israeli citizens to settlements in occupied Palestinian territory over decades is designed to perpetuate the occupation and make it permanent. Related to this policy is the displacement of Palestinian and establishment of coercive system of discrimination, zoning, planning, and lawful land appropriation, arbitrary arrest, and arbitrary violence since 1967. This foreseeable displacement of the occupied people and the transfer of citizens of the occupying power to occupied territory is prohibited under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention on the Protection of Civilian Persons in Time of War. Article 1 of that convention stipulates that every high contracting party to the convention is under an obligation to ensure compliance in all circumstances. The United Nations General Assembly, United Nations Security Council, and United Nations Human Rights Council have consistently and repeatedly condemned Israelis' effort to alter the demographic character and status of the occupied Palestinian territories. States' obligations. The international community has an obligation to prevent unlawful annexation of Palestinian land, a fundamental principle of international law as reflected in the Charter of the United Nations is that the use of force in any form is prohibited. Consequently, accusation of territory by use of force is illegal. The 75-year occupation and settlement policy of State of Israel is preventing the establishment of contiguous, viable Palestinian state is an affront to international law. The court should find that the legal consequences for the government of Israel in this regard should include 
the immediate cessation of all illegal acts, including settlements and associated legal and administrative frameworks, clearly reparations for and dismantling of illegal structures and legal frameworks is also an imperative. Third states are under a clear obligation not to recognize or assist the illegal situation present in the occupied Palestinian territory. State parties to the Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war and under obligation to ensure Israeli compliance with international humanitarian law as embodied in the Convention, including the unlawful transfer of citizens to occupied territories. United Nations General Assembly Resolution 77 by 25 called upon all states consistent with their obligations under the Charter and relevant Security Council resolutions to pursue a policy of non-recognition, non-cooperation, non-assistance to the Israeli occupation, and to ensure respect for international law in this regard. I would like to conclude that the primary legal consequences arising from Israeli's behavior is that there is now a de facto annexation by Israel of the Palestinian territories. There is no legal justification for continuing the Israelis' occupation and denying the Palestinian people right to self-determination. The Sultanate of Oman requests that the following issues are to be taken into account. A. The conduct and practices of an occupying power are well documented and strictly regulated in international law. The Fourth G Geneva Convention is clear that an occupying power may not transfer its civilian population to occupied territories. In addition, international law does not provide for permanent occupation or occupation legitimized through the establishment of, democratic, of demographic change, through settlement. The 75 year duration of Israeli presence in the occupied Palestinian territories and the persistence policy of settlement renders the Israeli occupation illegal and in breach of the United Nations Charter. B. The court should determine that Israel should bring to, a, to an immediate and unconditional end to this unlawful situation. Third states should support these efforts. Thank you very much. I thank the delegation of Oman for its presentation. And before I invite the next delegation to make its oral statement, the court will observe a break for 10 minutes. This sitting is suspended. <laughs>